Welcome to the Ghosts of Plum Run Hour, only on Midwestern Marks. I'm Tim Russo, the author of the Star Wars series for leftists, Ghosts of Plum Run. Joining us today for part two of our discussion of the charge of the first Minnesota, which is what the Ghosts of Plum Run is about, is uh, history professor Timothy Orr from Old Dominion. Welcome back, Tim. Glad to be back. Also joining us, as always, is our cadre from the shop floor mass line, Jonathan Searson. Hey, Tim. In and Tim. La- in his Lakers <laughs> yeah. jersey. Cel- Easy for yeah, you. I'm in Kobe Bryant tonight in so Memorial. Celebrating Kobe Bryant and also that LeBron James is still the best ever. Um, so, That's right. Tim, uh, you're a 90s music guy. You like Oasis. I also happen to know you like the Dandy Warhols. I do, I do. You know, not as strongly as um, as Oasis, but they're 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 in my wheelhouse. They're in the wheelhouse. So, uh, are you 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 are aware of what the song is going to be that opens the film of the charge itself? Is that not correct? Correct. Uh, the lead off song for their album, uh, their first album, right? I think it's the first uh, album. I think it's their third it's, album. Okay, but uh, uh, be in right. Be in, yes. So, yeah. so for the heads out there, 10 years from now, when we're on the Oscar stage, me and Tim holding up statuettes, uh, <laughs> be, be in is going to be the, the opening of the movie. And if you can find this video for proof that that is going to was always going to be the opening of the movie, you can also email Courtney, Courtney uh, Taylor, the lead singer of Dandy Warhols, who uh, mm-hmm. given us permission. So Ah, well, great, great. <laughs> uh, so, um, so the reason I bring that up as, as the Midwestern Marks Mass Line Music Minute to start this this part is because we're trying to get into the minds of the men in those two hours where they're sitting there waiting uh, for the inevitable. And let's question. Let's start with that. Two hours. What, is that how long they sat there? Yeah, about. Um, I mean, they arrived at Gettysburg on the, in the center of the Union line, you know, sometime like mid morning, maybe even earlier than that. So they're actually there for hours, but they, they, they get their orders to deploy uh, next to this artillery battery, you know, probably around, um, I don't know, yeah, 5, 4 p.m. maybe. Uh, so they're, they're, they're spending s- all day in reserve on, right. on the eastern slope of Cemetery Ridge. Yeah, so then they come up to the top of the ridge, and that is just around the time that the attack against Sickles Corps is starting. So they have a beautiful panorama of that scene. And it had to have been, I don't know, a a spine tingling and also very frightening moment for everyone in the ranks because they were watching the battle slowly ebb towards them. And I read enough accounts from Civil War soldiers to know that the waiting for the danger to come at you was the most agonizing moment of a battle. And they had the, what I just described in the film screenplay is the most agonizing wait. And, and the question I always had is, did they see Sickles move to his position? Yeah, they probably did. Uh, probably not right when he, his corps redeployed at 2 p.m. But once they came to the top of the ridge, they would certainly have seen it arrayed out in front of them. If you stand on that heard that he was moving out. Well, you know, when you're on the the east slope of Cemetery Ridge, which is where they are in reserve, it's a little bit lower in elevation. So it's much harder to see. So certainly they would have heard that the Union left was redeployed, but they weren't going to see it clearly until they got to the top of the ridge. And all of a sudden the cannon was booming. And and to give you just a, a... what I would see as proof of that is that even the army commander, George Meade, didn't know that Sickles had redeployed until hours afterwards when it was too late to recall him. Now, there is evidence that Hancock saw it happen, right? Yep. And so Hancock for our audience? Yeah, Winfield Scott Hancock is a West Point trained major general of volunteers. He commands the second corps, which is the corps to which the first Minnesota belongs. And during the Second day of the battle, he is the acting left wing commander. So eventually Sickles is wounded during the fight and Meade, the army commander, deputizes Hancock to command all the troops on the left side of the field. And earlier in the day, when Sickles moves forward, Hancock is a little bit farther left and a little bit higher up on the ridge because he's adjacent to 
uh, John Curtis Caldwell's division. And that's the division that goes to the wheat field and gets trounced when Sickles calls for aid. And so Hancock had a better position than anyone else to watch that redeployment. And Hancock kind of shit his pants when he saw it happen, didn't he? Yeah, he is purported to have turned to an aide when he sees this. And he says, you will soon see those men come tumbling right back. So he had the clairvoyance to know that this was a mistake and it wasn't going to end well. And he was exactly right. And maybe or maybe not did the first Minnesota know that at the time. Yeah. And if, if we're trying to put this all you know, sequentially, I would say the first Minnesota probably did not see that that moment happening because they were on the reverse slope of the ridge on the east side of it. And you had to be on the crest or the west side of it to watch it. But as soon as they came up to the crest, almost certainly they could see it happening. They could see the, the movement of Sickles troops positioning sell, themselves out on the Emmitsburg Road. So at that point, they had to have known if, and if they were smart enough as Hancock was, it was going to be a, a bad day. So this gap opens up. Uh, who orders the first Minnesota to fill to, to the battery uh, that was on the west side of the ridge to, to wait there? Right. So that decision falls to the divisional commander, John Gibbon, who's another West Pointer, and he will become acting corps commander when Hancock is elevated to acting wing commander. And the reason for the redeployment is that, again, there's this area where there are no troops, right? The, the Kurt, John Curtis Caldwell's division has been taken and sent to the left to reinforce Sickles. But then right on the crest of the ridge, this kind of open spot, there's a battery of six guns committed by a lieutenant named Thomas and six guns kind of by themselves need to have infantry support. So Gibbon sends an order to one of his brigade commanders, General Harrow. Harrow selects the first Minnesota to watch over the guns. And so the first Minnesota is detached from its parent unit and that parent unit is eventually sent to the front to fight along Sickles troops and then the first Minnesota is kind of forgotten about just sitting beside these guns. Yeah, as the, the men actually say it felt like we were forgotten. Yeah, and that's exactly it. Because, um, you know, if, if you were there on the top of the ridge, you're looking to your left and your right. And you can see the, the other artillery battery. But beyond that, no other troops, probably for another 800 yards or so. Right. You could see the, the battle going on in front at the Emmitsburg Road a half mile away. But then left and right, there's nothing around. So, so they, you're in this big gap. They get to the battery and they, and how do they deploy? They're on the ground. Yeah. Uh, most likely they were just kind of uh, laying down or perhaps even sitting uh, for those two hours that they're waiting. You know, you, I imagine the, the Colonel William Colville would not have wanted his men to be standing all that time. And, and usually there's a formation that, infantry can take when they are laying down where they'll be sort of kind of packed like sardines one rank up front and then one rank behind them with the heads of those men kind of right up against the feet of the guys in front so they're probably watching from they're propping themselves on their arms just kind of trying to get in a snapshot of the battle and you know as the the sun goes down over the horizon perhaps many of them even think that they might not even be engaged at all because of course, once it becomes dark, it's impossible to exercise command and control. So they may even be thinking, well, we may make it out of this without firing a shot, but they're generally deployed what's called line of battle, which is men shoulder to shoulder. So your, your closest uh, buddies are touching elbows with you. And then the second rank when it's standing is about a forearms length behind you. And Company A is stationed to the right directly of the, the colors. Right, right. So there are eight, there are eight companies deployed in line of battle. The, the first Minnesota has 11 companies. And a company is normally about 1,000 men, but in 1863, the first Minnesota was rocking only about 30 men per company. So the other three are deployed elsewhere. Um, and then the eight that are still on the line of battle, four on one side of the the, what's called the color guard, which protects the battle flag, four on the other. So, uh, Jonathan, you're going to like this part. Peter Marks was a corporal in Company A. Where would a corporal in Company A be positioned in, in, in that line with respect to the, to the colors? Uh, right in the front rank. So, corporals 
Uh, they're the um, one of the lowest ranking non-commissioned officers, so one step above private. But what corporals were used for in the Civil War when you're in line of battle is to mark the break in the squads and the platoons. So normally you'd have eight corporals, uh, and usually six were in the front rank, two were in the rear rank. Probably at this point in the war, you only had maybe like five or six corporals per company, and they would all have been in the front rank. And the reason for that is so the company commander can look and say, well, where do my squads break? Because I can see the corporal stripes on their arm. And so that's why they are placed where they are. And this means that being a corporal is one of the most dangerous things you can do because you are automatically in the front rank, no matter what, which means you're going to get the first round of lead. Which is why Peter Marx is our 48er and the ghost of Plum Run. Uh, so uh, Peter Marx gets Company A next to the callers. They, they, they either sit down or lay down on the ground. What is the corporal doing for those two hours? Well, at that point, he's probably has very little to do other than to simply reassure the men, right? If they're, they're called in the battle line, he doesn't have any major duties to do other than be an infantryman. You know, normally, corporals have a lot of duties when the regiment is on the march. You know, they have to form what are called corporals guards, which can do foraging expeditions or scouting expeditions. But at this point, he is really just in charge of his squad, right? So there is, there's a sergeant who is over him per squad. And then again, normal circumstances, two corporals per squad. And a squad is, is a, a fourth of a company. And so he would probably have a few privates that he would be looking after, reassuring them, bucking them up, you know, getting them ready for the fight, you know, because I think at this point, everyone kind of knew that they were going to be involved in something. The question was how and <laughs> under what circumstances. All right, so, so let's get back to that realization. So they're on the ridge they're at they're they're sitting next to the battery and 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 what are they seeing in the wheat field in the peach orchard well they probably can't see much of the wheat field because it is separated by a grove of trees called the trosal woods but they can clearly see the peach orchard and that area has got to be enveloped in smoke right because sickles put the bulk of his artillery out there and it was shelling the attacking confederates that were coming from the Seminary Ridge area, which was a mile away of, in, ahead of the first Minnesota. So all of that line would have been crackling with gunfire. It would have been reverberating with the thunder of the cannon. And then there would have been just giant clouds of thick white smoke covering the area. So everyone knew that Sickles troops were embattled. They could probably see some of the reinforcements going out to the Emmitsburg Road. There are several regiments taken from the, the second corps and sent to the third, including uh, two from their own brigade. So they would have just seen just a, a flurry of activity, horsemen riding hither and yon, uh, wounded men coming back from the front. And again, it, it, that's the, the, the awful moment where your, your uh, stomach just sinks, right? Because you you kind of see this happening, you know, that there is a lot of pain and misery out there and you're wondering whether it's going to drift your way. And so you think the light bulb went on, we're going to die when the third Corps broke and started running back. Correct. So the, the, the weakest point of Sickles position is the center of it at a place called the peach orchard, which is where the Emmitsburg road, which is this road that runs kind of midway between the two armies has an intersection with another road called the Millerstown road. And the Confederates break through there around 6, 630, and they just tear a huge wide hole in Sickles' line. And at that point, it's all over. No amount of reinforcements is going to save that destruction. And the lines just starts to peel back up the Emmitsburg Road. And uh, imagine anyone in the first Minnesota would have seen that happen as the, the Union line off the Emmitsburg Road is, is basically kind of rolled up, and the men that were there come running back pell-mell to their ridge, which is where they are, they are about, you know, anywhere between a half mile and a quarter mile away. How many guys do you think ran through the first Minnesota's line on the way out? Before they <laughs> that, that is not, uh, I'm not certain. Uh, I don't think it's going to be all that many, but Sickles, as I said, he had about 10,000 men in his core and then half of it was up on the Emmitsburg road. So that would mean about 5,000 men are coming rushing back. 
And again, some of those have fallen back steadily. Some of them have been wounded and just simply been transported out, out the field. But when the final break occurs and they come like a tidal wave, they are probably running on all sides like a giant mass of humanity. Where they're alive. Hopefully, hopefully none of them just tried to barge through the ranks because that would have been dangerous. But um, they certainly would have seen these men coming back in clumps, you know, panicked, frightened, powder encrusted. Uh, and that's a very demoralizing sight to see a fellow soldier just have the fight sucked out of them. So Jonathan, uh, any questions so far? Sure. Uh, you, you mentioned the smoke and the envelopment and everything. And I've heard that there were reports of, from the first Minnesota soldiers of seeing, you know, giants in the sky fighting through the smoke. Uh, how, how, can you describe those reports? How many do you have of that? Cause it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can't speak to the, the individual sources themselves, but I guess what I would say is that there's probably two ways to look at this. Uh, one from sort of an optical illusion point of view, you know, I've, when this is all happening, it's very late in the evening. So it's between seven and 8 PM. Right. So I've, I know from having worked at Gettysburg National Military Park is that that is when the shadows become very long, right? So there's a giant mountain range off to the west, the rays of light become diffused. And it's just, uh, just a golden aura is cast over the area. And then if you have these giant clouds, I guess it must be the projection of these long shadows on the clouds that would have the appearance of just, you know, giant uh, shadow puppets, right? And the other thing about it is, you know, I sort of know from studying other wars that when weird things happen in combat, people take notice of them, right? And this is a commonality of just how the human mind works under stress. There's a, there's a battle in the Pacific War in 1942 where uh, there's a Japanese sailor and his, his ship is being bombed and a bomb goes off right close to the side of the ship and it sends up a huge 30-foot water spout. This Japanese sailor looked into the water spout and he was fixed on it. And he said he thought he saw his mother's face in it and his mother had been long dead. And, you know, it's one of those weird things where people just see some sort of hard to describe object. like a Yeah, water spout but, or... you know, there's more than one report of the giants in the sky. OK, OK, but I'll... <laughs> more, more, more than one of these guys says at a certain point, it looked like they were watching giants fighting and it sounds like it's this optical illusion thing that you're talking about where the, the sun is going down smoke it's coming through smoke and it was humid that day right oh yeah very much so yeah so, especially so, toward towards evening yeah so yeah the, so the giants in the sky thing you know when you're writing a film you can't miss that you know you want to have the giants in the sky picture uh so let's assume for the sake of of argument they did see the giants in the sky so uh, they're watching the giants in the sky. Third Corps soldiers are coming through, covered in blood, carrying some carrying their own limbs. Now, Hancock and his aide, who you know very well, mm -hmm. uh, are, are at this moment attempting to fix this problem, right? That, that's right. So Hancock is the one who gets the first Minnesota moving. And so he has been trying to patch up this line at this kind of imperiled section of the Union line on Cemetery Ridge all afternoon. And he has just dropped off a brigade of New York troops a little bit farther south at the exact point where they need to be. And so Hancock, having completed that mission, is riding north towards the first Minnesota's position. He's farther with, with out in guy. front of them. With his What's guy. With, with his, his guy. Yeah. So he's got a, you know, generals usually have a staff of about 20 people with them. And Hancock has frittered all of his away. Right. <laughs> just running, or so he's got one guy left, uh, plus his guide on bearer. Uh, and so he turns to this, this captain. And what is his name? Is his name? What is his name? W.D.W. Miller. Yes. Um, captain Miller. He turns to W. Miller, Captain Miller, and says. Well, uh, so he, he's a little bit in front of the first Minnesota's position. He's coming up what's called the Plum Run Valley, a little dry creek bed. And what he sees is the Confederate troops that have broken through Sickles' line. This is Cadmus Wilcox's Alabama Brigade. And Hancock wrongly assumes these are Union troops. These are Sickles' men. 
Right. And so he's hoping to rally them. So he tells Miller to go, go stop these men and form them here along the creek bed. And as Miller gallops out towards them, he finds out that they are, in fact, the Confederates. And so the Confederates volley into him. Miller is wounded twice. And then Hancock realizes he's got to get out of there or else he's going to be killed or captured as well. So he starts heading east towards the crest of the ridge, which is right where the first Minnesota is. And, and so he rides a little bit. Where does he go before he gets to the first Minnesota? Uh, where he is beforehand? Yeah, so he leaves the Plum Run Creek. Miller is, is, is wounded and he's riding. Where is he riding to? And then how does he get to the first Minnesota? Well, I guess I'm not sure it was a read my mind question here. Like, he's to mean Thomas's battery first? So where does he go? Where, he's, he's on his horse. Yep. Hancock's on his horse. He rides. Right. I, doesn't he ride over the ridge to go find the reinforcements to come and fill the hole? Uh, no, I think the first thing he comes to is the first Minnesota. He leaves, right? so, he leaves Miller's wounding, goes to the battery. Right, right, to, right to the, yeah. And he right says, to the regiment. And he has a quote where he says, my God, are these all we have here? Correct. All right. So, yeah, that is the surprising thing to him, because when he comes to the first Minnesota, this is the only regiment that he sees. Right. And that is exactly what he says. My God, are these all the troops we have? Right. Because he yeah, he is expecting that there should be some sort of reinforcement coming to this area, but there is not. And as it turned out, there would be none. Uh, at that point, all the reinforcements had been committed. So uh, it was up to this one regiment to do the impossible, which was to stop a brigade that was coming through the hole. So what does he say to Colville? Well, the first thing he does is he shouts who commands the regiment. Right? He's looking for the colonel. So Colville is apparently dismounted at this point. So he kind of comes forward through the line. And Colville says, I do. I command this as the first Minnesota. And Hancock was a very um, brusque person. He didn't really stand on ceremony a whole lot. So according to just about every major account of this encounter, Hancock just gives him the order to go. And he says, Colonel, advance and take those colors. So he points at Wilcox's brigade. And with that, Hancock rides off. So there's very little ado. And Colville orders his men to their feet if they weren't uh, on their feet already. They level their bayonets, and then they charge. And who leads that charge? Is Colville at the front or the back? Well, my presumption is he's got to be you know, on the front, at least leading them out. Uh, normally, a colonel would be mounted but behind the men. Uh, but I think Colville was, was on foot in front. Uh, that's By most accounts, that's where he is. So by the time that they actually make contact with the Confederates. I'm sure that Colville and the other field officers went behind the line so the infantrymen could do their thing. But on the way out, he's one foot in front with his sword in one of the most dangerous places you could be. And when did Wilcox, Wilcox's brigade notice that the first Minnesota was coming at them? <laughs> Probably almost when they were on top of them. So Wilcox's brigade had had a very hard afternoon. Uh, they had been fighting basically since noon. Uh, they have a spirited firefight at a place called Pitzer's Woods where they suffer 50 casualties. And then they attack Sickles Front. And Sickles Front is no easy nut to crack. They, they, they lose a lot of men there. And then as soon as they come over the ridge and they're kind of moving towards the Plum Run Valley, they're attacked by two other regiments, the 19th Massachusetts and the 42nd New York. And, and these regiments, they put up a very... Uh, thin defense before they pull out. And then finally, they see this third line coming at them, coming off the ridge. So Wilcox's men just simply fire whatever ammunition they have left to try to stop them. Hold on, but, hold on. So they step off. Now, there are reports that men got hit before they even took the first step off the charge in the first Minnesota. Is that, do you think that's accurate? Yeah, I mean, they would have been hit by like straight fire. Right. So as soon as they stood up, they're 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 in a line of fire. Oh yeah, for sure. Because if you go to to that position, you'll see that cemetery ridge where the first Minnesota is is roughly at the same height as the Emmitsburg Road ridge, which is in front of them. And then there's this 
very low valley called the Plum Run Valley between them. So any stray shots that were aimed at Sickles men could easily fall in amongst the first Minnesota. So the first you're saying the first Minnesota benefited from the smoke of the battlefield. They could have been running through the smoke of the battlefield and not seen by Cadmus Wilcox's brigade uh, before they uh, made contact. Yeah, um, they, I mean, the first Minnesota certainly took casualties approaching. Uh, there's a bunch of accounts that say as they're moving towards their target, men are falling out of the ranks at every step. But uh, the thing about it, most of Wilcox's men have been just simply fighting constantly trying to get to Cemetery Ridge. And, and you know, just to make it very clear, Wilcox's men are in very, uh, a very foul mood because they expected that as soon as they broke Sickles' front, they thought it, their day was over because right? that's where they thought the Union line was. And then to see that there was a real line farther away that was a half mile to the rear, they're like, we didn't sign on for this, <laughs> right? So, so the, the fact that they're, they're continuing to face Union reinforcements is, is of great annoyance to them. They're wasting ammunition on it. And so when the first Minnesota comes tearing at them, that is the last thing that they want to see. So they weren't even expecting there to be anybody there. No, no. There's a great account from a uh, Confederate artillery commander named E. Porter Alexander, who wrote after the war about that exact moment when they Confederates breached the Peach Orchard line and they're up on the Emmitsburg Road and they're looking down the Plum Run Valley. And they can see another Union line atop Cemetery Ridge. And they're like, what the hell, man? This is not what we expected. We thought that rolling up the Union left was going to be enough, but now they have to fight a second position. So it's the perfect situation for somebody to punch you in the face. <laughs> exactly. So, and they, exactly. Got, they got punched in the face. And, and, and now there's, there's a debate about whether or not the first Minnesota halted or any part of the line halted in mid charge mm -hmm. to fire. Do you know anything about that? You know, my, my presumption is that the first Minnesota reaches the Creek bed, right? That's, that's as far as they get. Because they, uh, several accounts point out that they had to fight their way through the, the bushes and shrubs along right. the, the dry creek bed, and that's when they they pause the fire. So so I think that's that's where they they come to a stop, and at that point they're like, well, all we have left is our weapons. Let's just shoot and try to fire enough that we can do enough damage to Wilcox's brigade so it it pulls back. So I think that is where the bulk of the regiment's casualties occur. You know, some of them are are shot and getting to the end that point but once they stop and they're engaged in this face-to-face -face firefight with Wilcox that's where the regimental casualties pile up and they pile up on the right hand side of the regiment because they're being enveloped right yeah I imagine on both sides to be honest because um it's probably yeah it, it might be I mean it's probably both right because you're, you're talking about a brigade at least started the day with 1,500 men. Uh, Wilcox probably didn't have that many at that point, but at least a thousand of Wilcox. had when they hit? I'm guessing about a thousand, maybe You're fewer. You're saying a thousand. I'm saying 1,200, maybe 1,100. Yeah, here's the thing, though. You know, Civil War battles, you know, when, when a guy is hit uh, and you have a wounded man, there is no combat medic to get him off the field. The only way you can transport a wounded man to the rear is if four of his friends pick him up. So for every wounded man, four more are going to the rear. So you're thinking about a thousand. I'm thinking only about a thousand at most at that point. And, uh, but nevertheless, a thousand men uh, facing 270, that line well overlaps. All right, let's lines. get to that. Now, 262 is the number on the monument. Right, okay. And that, that number uh, comes from a single source, William Lochran's account. He's this, this lieutenant who was very much important in reunion organ, uh, commemoration after the war. And his account uh, said that there were 262 men involved in the attack. By my, by my humble calculations, I think it is 271. And this confirms with what Colville himself said. He said in a letter after the war, 269, right? So... Colville and I are quibbling over two to two men, but I think 262 might be a little bit too small, but again, it's only, it's only nine men. So it's, it's definitely Lochran's in the ballpark. He's just not, he's not precise. So I'm so, thinking, I'm thinking two, 271 is my, my, my official count. So, so that number has been debated and will continue to be debated forever, but 
Yeah. Um, Jonathan has a question about the monument. Mm -hmm. uh, we have about nine minutes left, so we're going to get to the monument. Jonathan. Yeah. Um, hold on a second. I got a picture of it thanks to <laughs> Tim's book. Let me find a chapter beginning. So, yeah, so yeah, but, the, the monument um, that's there now is not the monument that they proposed. That is the monument that was proposed is a soldier stabbing a serpent. The monument mm -hmm. that, that's there now is 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 a soldier running at double quick. Correct. And and and, and John, go ahead. Um, I feel strongly that the uh, monument with the soldier bayoneting the serpent was the better choice than the double quick one. Um, I think that because the double quick, I mean, it could be said of any battle in the Civil War. You know, these there's innumerable charges of the Union lines both in the war effort and the soldiers. You know, is it? what was the process of them coming up with this? Was there a vote on it or did like, did the regiment decide, Hey, this is the one we want to go with out of the options they had. Cause it was an option they had to choose from. Right. 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 Uh, so, you know, monuments that kind of spring up in the post civil war era, they spring up in multiple ways. You know, sometimes they're funded by state government uh, taxes. Like this happens in Pennsylvania where, every Pennsylvania veterans group has additional money, but a great many of these monuments are privately funded. So this is the regimental veterans, you know, collecting their own cash, their hard earned cash together to create a monument that they think best expresses their, um, what their regiment did. But then once you have the design together, you know, you've contacted some sort of sculptor and you fashion together what you want your monument to look like, then you had to have it approved. And there was a private organization that did that. And it was called the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. And it, it, was, it was run by a, a, veteran, a Civil War veteran named John Badger Batchelf. And he was arguably the first professional historian of the battle. And the thing about it was that Batchelder had rules that every monument had to follow and that they had to have a certain kind of information on the monument and certain things that got represented. And for whatever reason, Batchelder and his sort of executive group for the GBMA didn't like the first Minnesota's initial design. And yeah, I bet has to be redesigned. I mean, I mean who, do, we, do we know who was on that, that committee who made that decision? That's a good question. Uh, for that, that particular uh, regiment, I do not know. But, um, you know, Batchelder had several people and i imagine he himself was the most you know vocal about wh what monuments should look like and it is not the only monument design he vetoed by the way there's many other regiments that had different ideas for what their their emblem should be but were any of them uh, I, badass as as bayoneting a serpent uh i don't think i've ever seen anything that is quite so violent looking and uh, this is probably the great um disturbing thing about it is, is we know that one of the most violent looking monuments on the field today is the Mississippi monument that has a Confederate soldier swinging his, his, um, they get to be the badasses every time. And, yes. And, and, and the union guys, Oh, we're just going to run it double quick. You know, we're just going to be right. But of course the difference is that the Mississippi monument is established in uh, the 1960s, right, during the civil sure. rights era, right? right? So it's a very different process. Uh, I think there's only one other union unit that comes close. The 72nd mm -hmm. Pennsylvania has a guy swinging his, his musket like a bayonet, but again, you don't see the person that's getting hit, right? So, you know, my, my, my take on this whole monument kerfuffle is that it's kind of up to the viewer to decide what they think is the message you want to send. And I think and Jonathan's right that the the exterminator position with the, the guy stabbing the snake, that one that one best represents what the veterans wanted you to see, right? They wanted you to remember that they they defeated the snake of the rebellion, right? right. That that is what they did. But you know, the other thing, the the double quick guy, 
what that forces you to think about is not the destruction of the Confederacy, but the sacrifice of the men that they went on this suicide mission and they died doing it. Right. right. And that's that's just a judgment call. Right. Uh, if, you, if you think that the, the story of the first Minnesota is about defeating the Confederacy and you should feel disappointed that the serpent stabbing one didn't happen. But if you think the true story is the men who gave their lives to go on that charge that Hancock ordered, then you should be happy with the one that presently exists. So uh, the, the, the monument itself that, 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 that was, uh, there were three drafts, right? There were three mm-hmm. drafts of that monument. One of which was that's there now, one of which was the serpent getting stabbed. And then there was a third one, right? Yeah, and I, I believe that's the one that it marks their position on the third day, right? No, there, there was were... a third proposal for the charge monument. I guess I haven't seen that one then. Um, so you'd be more the expert on it than I would. That's Daryl Sanis's department at the Twin Cities Civil War Roundtable, who we hope to have on the show <laughs> at some point shortly. Uh, Daryl, this is for you. We're talking about your pet issue because Daryl Sanis apparently looked for this. All right, good. Well, then he can he can uh, fill in the uh, the parts that I was unable to fill in tonight. So good. that'll be good. Good. Uh, <laughs> so we're we're down about three minutes left before Zoom cuts us off. Uh, any? Do you have any uh, questions for us, Tim? Since we've been we've had you on the witness stand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess uh, you know, since I've known you, Tim, that you have this uh, incredible fascination for the first Minnesota, and I guess I would always love to know what is it that. Um, about their story that inspired you? Well, it's the why I didn't hear about it. Um, you know, when, when you start asking the question, why didn't you hear about the first Minnesota growing up? But you heard about the pickets charge that went across the same ground the next day. Mm-hmm. You start to ask all the questions that, and you, went, and you end up in this leftist uh, universe where you, uh, you, you start, it starts to make sense why you wouldn't hear about it, why you would hear about the pickets charge the next day that went through their blood the blood of the first Minnesota. I mean, they literally walk across the blood of the charge that saved the country the next day. And that's the one we're talking about. That's the one everybody knows about is Pickett's charge. Do you ever run yeah. into people at the bat when you were working at the, at the park? Did you ever run into people who were upset about this at all? Or. Oh, about the, the sort of pro Confederate slant. That yeah, had. Yeah. yeah. And you know, there's always the, the big difference between the people who work there and then kind of the story the monuments tell, right? Cause when, when I work there, we did our utmost to ensure that the, the, the theme, the high watermark of the Confederacy was not the main thing, right? Mm-hmm. So, so our interpretive approach was always to emphasize the sacrifice made by the Union Army and then the result of the Civil War in terms of emancipation. So I, our, our main theme was the new birth of freedom, right? But the, the problem was that long before I got there, long before many of my colleagues got there, the United States went through this period of time when it was right. obsessed with the lost cause. And, right. and that was the fault of historians of the early 20th century. And there were a great many of them. Uh, Douglas Southall Freeman, uh, Ulrich Bonnell Phillips, um, and um, uh, who's the uh, William Dunning with the Reconstruction School. Ken so Burns. All, can't, we're going to end on, yeah, Ken, but, we're going to, we're going to end on, cause we're going to get cut off here, but yeah. But, yeah. yeah. And, and, and even, right, even right. Ken Burns, even Ken Burns, who, who brought in Shelby foot of all people, one of the right. strongest lost cause historians. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 and, and that's the thing was it just, um, historians didn't do enough in the 20th century to approach the civil war even handedly and, and great many Confederate units and Confederate figures got lofted above uh, figures in the United States Army. Uh, and it's, it's a shame that, that the first Minnesota story has kind of receded into the shadows. Not anymore, thanks to Midwestern Marks. Uh, we appreciate you joining us, Tim. This has been a blast. We hope you join us again. Will you join us again sometime? Absolutely, it's my, awesome. my pleasure. All right, it's, well, maybe we'll get you and Daryl on the same call at some point. Sure thing, <laughs> whatever you want. Uh, this has been <laughs>